Well, I've been asked um, to introduce Philip and his work. Uh, but when I read Anna's uh, words in the exhibition catalogue, I thought, well, there's absolutely nothing else for me to say. She summed it all up absolutely perfectly. She said, Philip Sutton's joyous vision of the world around him feels particularly crucial right now. Isn't it marvellous and incredibly heartening for those of us who are trailing a little bit behind you in the age stakes, Philip? Um, that a nonagenarian's art can be so relevant, so vital, so alive, and so full of joy. That is the first thing I feel every time I look at a piece of Philip's work. Joy. And boy, that is exactly what we need right now in this world. A bit of soaring, unalloyed joy something that connects us with nature, with a kind of intrinsic life force, and you have it. It isn't just the sheer colour, unambiguous though that is, it's the simple smack in the face, it jolts you to life when you're confronted with Philip's work. You can't not feel something. It's immediate, simple, welcoming joy. But this natural simplicity belies a brilliant technical mastery. As anyone who's ever tried it knows the seemingly effortless no makeup makeup requires a lot of preparatory work. <laughs> it's the hardest thing to pull off without utter confident know-how. I think for Philip that technical mastery began early through observation of his father's work. His father sold signs door to door. Then as a tea boy in the design drawing offices of the Norris Warming Company, before doing his national service and getting a place at the Slade, where he rightly ignored fashion and inspired by Matisse, went his own way. The only way that a real artist can ever go, in my opinion. And drawing, drawing, drawing. My own art teacher says, if you make a good drawing, you will never make a bad painting. And I think he's absolutely right. And with Philip, observation is the foundation. Uh, of course, behind every great man, there's a great woman too. In Philip's case, his late wife, Heather Cook, an artist in her own right. The door can swing anyway. It needs to, as long as it's on firm hinges. Some 25 years ago, gosh, I, I blush to think, <laughs> I entered through a very sturdy door into uh, Philip's daughter Saskia's house. And that was the first time I felt the full impact of Philip's work. His paintings adorned every wall. And my senses were assaulted. There is absolutely no other word for it. I fell in love immediately and I've remained smitten ever since. It would be easy to think that Philip's enduring vividness of colour might be due to his time in Australia and Fiji, as we saw in the film, in the 1960s, a bit like David Hockney's epiphany in The Light of California. But I don't believe this. I think it was always there. It's a mark of Philip's wonder at the continuing miracle of life. Here's what he has to say about it, because you've heard enough from me. And I'm going to quote you now, Philip. Philip says, I'm in favour of creativity. We're human beings. We live in the world surrounded by the most amazing phenomena. Nature is my greatest teacher. The world I live in is my greatest teacher. My work is to do with my environment. When I saw him recently, it wasn't that long ago, uh, he's an avid audio booker, by the way. Philip told me he was revisiting Proust, à la recherche du temps perdu. He told me about it at length, and I felt very excited because I felt he was embarking on a new phase in his work, a particularly exciting phase. And it was to do with his interior environment 
as much as his physical environment. What a truly wonderful thing, and how I envy you the excitement of that journey, Philip. Shakespeare is another writer who's played a significant role in Philip's life. Although hundreds of years apart in time, they are kindred spirits, I feel. Shakespeare has been, if I may say so, a muse of fire for Philip. Both men painting pictures, one in words, the other in paint, but both in feelings. The synergy is clear, and I'm going to quote Philip again. Philip says, Colour is poetry, music and literature, and some mysterious mixture called dreams all mixed together. As Shakespeare says, you have your entrances and your exits, and between those two things, many things happen to us. We have families, we have relationships with people, beginning with our parents, family life, whatever that may be. So we're surrounded by situations all the way through, from our entrances to our exits. So this urge to play and make and record and try and understand the world we live in is what we do. There's no secret. You have to listen to yourself and be modest about what you understand and try to understand the situation that you're in. The sense of wanting to reflect on it and make something of it is part of the human condition. If you have courage and perseverance, and a certain faith in yourself, and you're lucky enough to have some kind of environment that encourages that, it's full steam ahead from your entrance to your exit. You have a certain amount of energy. It's a universal thing. The creative thing in us humans is what brings us together. And that is what <laughs> Philip Sutton has done this evening. Philip, you've brought us all together to celebrate and enjoy your work, and I'm certainly going to do that. Thank you. So now, Anna, are we doing questions? Uh, no, I think Phil wants to Oh, Phil, you want to say something? Yes. <laughs> are you going to say something? Sure. He's going to stand. Uh, there's a mic. So um, good. Any questions? Uh, no, you were you going to say something. The questions and answers will come after. So if you want to just say a few words, oh, can you just say a few okay. words, yeah? Well, thank you very much for that resume. It's, it's about look, looking at old photos of yourself and the family and so on. It's always a strange phenomena of a mixture of love and nostalgia, I suppose. And um, uh, life, the, the life that goes on around you, for us all, is very complex and, and difficult and the various factors that play their role in your lives, which is the family, money, prestige, and people liking you or liking your work and so on. Um, I've, I personally have been very lucky and I've been, um, I've had some very uh, lucky friends who have helped me along the way and you uh, as a creative person whatever whether you write poetry plays music literature novels and so on you you have um, the necessity for other people to both appreciate what you try to do and and hopefully um, help you if you if they can. And I've been very lucky in this. I've had some very and I uh, looking back over the time now, um, 
I have no explanation for it at all because I, I think that chance and what happens to all of us is, is very um, in the balance between disaster and happiness, more or less all the time. And some of us are unfortunate, and some are more fortunate. Uh, so there are various things that play a role in anybody's life and certainly if you want to write poetry or write a play or write some music or paint a picture, you need a certain kind of self-support really in it's, it's a strange mixture because you have to be partly self-centred and selfish uh, in the process, but not too much. If you're too much, the balance is against you. So it's a balance in, in life's adventures between adventures and relationships with people and your family which is different for and everyone as far as I can understand it everyone has a different take and has different needs and I've been very lucky in my choice of family as far as that goes and I think you you need a certain amount of good luck in these things to be able to sail forward into the seas of life, which uh, can be very rough. You can hit very difficult times. But on the other hand, you need a good deal of optimism because otherwise... You can't create anything, yeah. whether it's cities or symphonies. You need a certain amount of courage to say that, yes, I can do this, I, I can do it, I, I'll try, and, I, and whether I fail or not, I will do it, I'll make an attempt at it. Uh, and that's, I guess that that's... Uh, a very important ingredient that you need the optimism to make the attempt to do something. We all, I think we all need it. The children need it, grown-ups need it. We need the courage to make the attempt to do something or make something. And uh, some of us have been more lucky than others. Uh, there's no, I don't think there's, personally, I don't think there's any explanation for chance. I, I think it just happens in certain ways that are completely immaterial to one's desires or hopes and so on. And one lives for something special that you can do yourself and you get the pleasure if you can manage it you get the pleasure from making something which is your own and nothing can replace that I think it's a, it's a very treasurable treasure thing to have something uh, that you have done and nobody else has done this it's quite uh, a tricky thing because you have to learn whether you're a writer or a musician and so on. You have to learn techniques of language because if you want to express yourself, you've got to be articulate. And to be articulate means you've got to understand language, which, which uh, whatever subjects you you want to take on 
whatever it is. Uh, so it's always seemed to me very important that you understand the value of language and in as a painter you have the language of shapes and and balance and how things are constructed. Everything's constructed. The mountains are constructed, a bicycle's constructed. Uh, a raindrop running down the window is constructed. So if you wish to go ahead as a painter, you've got to try, I think. Well, anyway, this is how I understand it. You've got to try and understand how you can create something by understanding this world about you um, and how it's constructed. And I personally think that that's the key to all good work, to understand how it's constructed and made with a very large dose of imagination on top, as it were. So there we are. Q&A, allow people to ask questions. Yeah, questions, okay. okay. Do you want to sit down or you're okay? No, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. Thank you, sir. More in if you... Yeah, yeah. I, okay. Uh, if if, if um, anyone would... Uh, with Anybody permission, have a question? We ask, uh, anyone would like to ask questions? There's a sorry. gentleman at the back over there, right at the back. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask about the process, Philip. I mean, we saw on the, the film mm. you sitting on Falmouth Dock sketching and making preparatory sketches. As you've, you know, got older, do you still do the same process? That these pictures here, are there lots of preparatory sketches and drawings or no, has that changed over the years? No, uh, there are certain things that, just like when you're younger and you get, you get a teenage and then you become middle-aged and so on, you become older and so on, responsible and whatever, you change. And so you have to, part of the creative process of any kind, whatever your medium is, is to change with yourself because you're not the same person. You look maybe well. You don't even look the same because you <laughs> start to change physically. So you have to whatever is applicable at any given moment. Like if, you know, this film was made uh, twenty or thirty years ago, uh, and if there was a or film longer. made fifty years ago, <laughs> and so on, it would be different. So. We're different, we are actually different people at different times of our lives, I think. And somehow you have to respond to what you are. You can't pretend to be something that you, the whole secret of understanding the world around you, if that's what you want to do, is to also understand yourself. And understanding yourself means that you recognize the qualities that you have and the qualities you don't have and the shortcomings that you have. So the whole thing, as it were, wraps itself round, round and round. So whatever I was doing then, I, with, there's no possibility that I would do it now, of course, <laughs> at all. And if I did do it, it would be completely, completely <laughs> wrong in, in the sense that it would be artificial because you... The secret of understanding things is, I think, is to have a fresh eye, a mind, to be able to see what's around you so that you can make something of it. You wanted to come back in. So, so the next question? No, no, same question continuing. The, the picture on your left, for example, did you start that with the intention of did you know how it was going to be, uh, did you know what the end result was? Did you have preparatory sketches and, and was there is it a particular landscape or is it more a work of imagination based on the, you know, the thousands of 
seascapes you've seen before? Uh, no, I, I, I'm afraid you're, uh, you're, uh, you're on the wrong rail lines. The thing about doing something like that picture, or any of the other paintings, or any of my other pictures, for instance, is that you have to try and understand what it is where you are. So if you stand in a certain spot to paint something, there's something that you have to understand about that place. Or if it's a person, that you're, if it's a child that you're painting or your friend or whatever and so on, you have to somehow put yourself in the place of a kind of detective because you have to search out what it actually means to you, whatever the subject is. And the only way you can, as it were, pull it off, so to speak, is by being completely genuine about your response to what you think it is. So there's no there's no short there's, there's no shortcut at all. You have to try and have a clear mind to understand what you're actually looking at at any given moment, either at the beginning of the picture or at the end of the picture or in between. So that's the task of the creative person, whether it's poetry or, as I say, or music and so on. You need a clear mind, as near as you can... Uh, obviously, the mind can't be... I used to think that the mind could be absolutely... But it can't, and I've now realised it's an impossibility. You can't clear your mind of everything and have a clear mind, that's impossible. Does that answer your question? what you, you can question? do is um, yeah. take yeah. away the kind of, as it were, the, the, all, all the rush around in your mind that, um, so that you can see something fresh only at that moment. That's a very good uh, response, Philip. I'm going to ask for the next question now. There's a lady just here uh, mm. by the pillar. Um, could you talk to us a little bit about the colour blue and yeah. and what you feel about the colour blue? Because I'm sitting here and I'm so aware of the colour blue. And how I can't hear what you The saying. lady was asking you about the colour blue because there's so much blue, uh, particularly in these pictures around you. And she was asking you about your relationship to the colour blue. I'm oh, sorry, I, I have to get that into it. I can't hear you. What, what? Can you hear me now? The lady was asking you about the colour blue. because colour so blue. Yes. So many of the pictures in the room here are a particular blue colour and what the, what the uh, relevance of that blue is to you. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis colour... Um, as far as I can understand it, the most amazing thing is that you don't understand it at all. And I don't <laughs> understand it. And so therefore, to admit that I, you don't understand something gives you, in a certain sense of the word, a freedom. So you try to put on one side, as it were, any way of, like with, as you say, blue, I mean, it's, one, it's a wonderful colour, of course, but the point is that you, you have to be able to, to be so open to what you're studying that if it comes out, if you fall over, as it were, blue, then that's how it appears. But of course, if you don't fall over it, then it doesn't appear. Mm. So it's no question of it, of your personal uh, uh, taste in colour, whether it's blue, yellow, blue, black, and so on. It's all a question 
of what comes out from what you're studying, what is suggested. So if you were, look, as I say, if you're looking at a bicycle and seeing how it, I, I've no idea what would come, but whatever it would be, as long as you were studying the bicycle and not bringing it with you, as it were, mm. uh, it would be fine. So in a, basically, the answer really is, as long as it comes without you knowing what it is, that's fine. <laughs> but you, anything that you know about, like, you like this or you like that, it should be dark or it should, whatever and so on, is of no use. Mm. The knowledge that you have is of no use and your experience of paintings or, or writing a novel and so on is of no use because you have to approach what you're doing as if you've never written a novel before. Does that answer your question? <laughs> it's really interesting. Yeah. Yeah. There was a question here. Yes, I'm interested to know how important to you is the response of other people to your paintings? Well, um, that stuff. In one you. sense, <laughs> it's like rather like a good meal, which. <laughs> you sit down and you're hungry and you eat something very nice and it's very pleasurable when you think, oh, that's very nice. So in one sense, it's like that about what people would think. But in another sense, of the, uh, it's meaningless. <laughs> Absolutely no meaning whatsoever. Well, uh, I mean, if you take pictures to an art dealer which I've done many times, you might say, well, of course, you hope he's going to like what you do, of course, because he's got a gallery and he sells pictures and you probably need the money. <laughs> but in actual fact, apart from that, it's absolutely quite meaningless. Mm -hmm. And even your family, for instance, who, shall we say, belong to a, a, a pro-personal club because they're in your favour, because they love you and so on. Um, it's also, no, I mean, it's very nice. Of course, it's, it's very pleasant. But it's meaning. It's got no meaning to it. What other people think about what I do is absolutely meaningless to me. And it's not because I'm arrogant and think I'm so superior to other people. It's not like that at all. It's just... It's, uh, painting for me has never meant to be a form of some, uh, something, of a communication that people will say, oh, Phil, that's, that's wonderful. I... It, I, I, it, it, it's not. It, it's not part of my item and my life. It doesn't exist for me. Uh, That's why it's so uh, when successful. When I went to Fiji and painted there and came back, of course I was pleased that people liked some pictures and so on. But it, uh, it was immaterial to me, actually. I mean, I know it affects me because. I have to pay my taxes like everybody else <laughs> and do things that cost money, just like everyone. So in that sense of the thing, of course, it's very nice if someone says, well, I think that's wonderful, I'll buy it. So that, you think, well, that's not, that's good. Of course, I'm pleased about that. But it's got nothing to do with what I do, mm. nothing to do with it at all. It's completely foreign. But it's a bit like having... Double glazing fix. <laughs> you have your double glazing fix because it keeps the house warm and the electricity bills go, you hope, go down. So that's fine. But it's a meaning, it's got no meaning to it. And, uh, and uh, it's, uh, Philip, I don't I'm going to ask for another question now. 
Good There's morning. a lady there yes. who's got a question. Thank you. Um, I feel, my name's Linda. I, I, you talked this evening about luck. You've used that word luck mm. in, in your speech. And I just want to ask you something um, which has got a sort of personal matter to me because I, I want to ask you about was there luck in getting into the Slade as opposed to getting into Boscombe School of Art? Do, do you know what I mean? What was it that the Slade gave you that maybe somewhere else wouldn't have? Was that luck or was that... I'm asking what you because I'm very dear... My godson has just got into the Slade. Oh, and I want to hear from you about what does that feel like to get into such a, a, a wonderful space? And is that love or is that sheer talent? What's that about? Was the slave the door that opened for you the world that you're in? Well, there's a lot of questions there. Well, I'm, not <laughs> I'm not sure I can answer them all. Uh, you mentioned the slave yeah, where I was a student yeah. and, and I was uh, I got an extra year and, and then I got... Uh, a year in France as a scholar fellowship. Well, my career at the Slade was, uh, as far as I understand it now, was very strange because I went in as a new boy, like everyone uh, did at that time, who uh, started and so on. And I, I really didn't know. I, I know it's very difficult to believe now, but I'd never heard of people like Rembrandt and Donald <laughs> and Michelangelo and so on. And then I slowly learned art history because we were taught it. So that made a kind of landscape, which of course was what it was meant to do. But the more I thought about it, the less meaning it had for me. And in the end, as the year, as the three to four years went on, it became mean again. It became I couldn't I couldn't grasp when I looked round when I got a bus from Tottenham Court Road back to Battersea where we lived, and so on. It, 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 art history meant absolutely nothing to the to the bus and people on the bus or anything else. So I couldn't. It never worked. Basically, it never worked for me. But when Later on, when I got this fellowship to France for a year, and we travelled down, hit my wife and I, we had no children then, we'd only just got married, and we travelled down, hitchhiking down France, to a cottage that we I'd found. On the same day that I got the fellowship, I, a friend told me about this cottage. So we hitchhiked down, and on the way we, went, we stopped at Lascaux, the primitive... Uh, the, uh, where, where the cave paintings are. And they knocked me off my perch because they were then dated 20,000 years <laughs> BC. And they were amazing and they didn't seem to fit, they certainly didn't fit art history. <laughs> and they didn't fit anything else either. But they were obviously... The animals were incredible, and the, in particular the one in the roof. There was a big ball-like figure in the roof, painted on the roof of the cave. And I noticed that the head of the bull, if it was a bull, I, it looked vaguely like one, the head was actually a rock coming out of the ceiling of the cave. And the person that had painted the animal had used the rock and painted round the rock for the head. So the head was actually in three dimension. It's astounding. I, 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 I just was astounded by this. Uh, so anyway, that, that, that sent me thinking. But I really, I, I couldn't, I, it sent me thinking, but I couldn't really place... It, it disturbed me, but it was it was very interesting. It was a very interesting disturbance, as it were. But it didn't go away, and it stayed with me. So when I went back to London to after the year was up, and, and I took some paintings back that I'd done, it stayed with me, and it stayed with me 
more or less my whole life, really, in a very strange way. And I've tried to understand what I think they were doing in these caves. And the idea that they were doing some kind of message to future, I don't, I think was absurd, personally. And what I now understand, as in over the last recent five, ten years, which I've tried to work out, what I now understand about it, as, as far as I can see, is that what they were doing was trying to understand themselves. These animals that they were painting were trying to come to terms with their environment. What, what it was, whatever it was, 20,000 years BC. And incidentally, in recent research on the caves there, the uh, date is now put at 40,000 years, for whatever that's worth. So they were done 40,000 years ago. And my take on it now is I understand what they were doing, they were trying to come to terms with their environment. And I think that's exactly what we should do ourselves. I should do. And, and if anyone wanted my advice, I would give that same advice, is to come to terms with themselves. And that's what I think as a final thing is, is what I try to do. But whether I do it or not, is it's not my job to judge. That's what you're striving to else. do, Philip. That's but what that's you're what striving I try to for. Do, is to come to terms with myself. What is it that I'm trying to do here? And so I leave that with you to ponder on. Are there any other questions? Yes, gentlemen there. A, a, a very quick one. Uh, yes or, or no will do. From the magnificent blackbirds on that magnificent jumper you've got <laughs> and the blackbirds there yeah. the blackbirds there the blackbirds there the blackbirds there mm. is there any significance yes or no <laughs> oh there's a great deal of significance yeah. in birds because i've observed them for ever since my mother told me to do some robins for christmas cards <laughs> <laughs> when i was about eight years old I started doing robins for Christmas because she didn't buy Christmas cards then. Um, no, I observe birds all the time now and I sit and watch them at the seafront and so on. And the thing about birds, as far as I understand looking at them, is that they're always in the right place. <laughs> A bird is never in the wrong place. And when they come over, <laughs> down, swoop past, or go, whatever they do, always seems to be right. And I put this down to the simple fact that they're not thinking about themselves. And I think that this, to me, is quite significant. <laughs> that to be like a bird is to stop thinking about what you're doing and just whatever it is you do. And that, that's why I think the birds are a very good friend to me because they tell me to stop thinking about things that are not appropriate. There's another question on my right, actually. Right. One more. Sorry, what was that? Oh, I can't see you behind there. Oh, yes, let's have that lady and then this lady on my right. So you go ahead, mate. Go ahead, okay. please. Philip, uh, in the film, there was a really lovely thing that you said about when you went to Fiji and you had to get away from the kind of current modern art scene in London, I suppose. And that's how you kind of got the confidence to be yourself. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of getting away from the environment to learn what it is that you want to do? Yeah, well, basically we're bombarded with everything you could possibly think of, literature, pictures, television, whatever it is. And 
the one characteristic about most of it is that somebody else is telling you something. You're not thinking it, you're being told something. Now, from my point of view, that's no use. I don't want to be told. I don't know, I, in, in the fact that I don't know something, I want to find out about it, but I want to find out about it. I don't want someone to tell me whatever it is. So the freedom of work comes with self detachment to your own whatever you whatever we like to call ourselves human or whatever uh, whatever words we like to use to be ourselves it's quite i find it quite it's very simple to be something that you are yourself what you think you are is is more than enough you don't need somebody else we, I don't need these. I don't need to be told. What I need to do is to think for myself. Is that me? Is that what I want? Um, and there's a question here on my right. Um, Philip, I want to find out a bit more about that wonderfully coloured jumper with a <laughs> very distinctive bird that's black on it. Did Did you have a hand in the design of that jumper? And was it made for you? Is this it? jumper? Yeah. Oh, my daughter made it for me. <laughs> Saski made it for me. Uh -huh. right. She wanted me to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> she does, she does love those things. So I'm wearing it. <laughs> I do what my daughters tell me. <laughs> That's a clever father for you. Well, if that's, if that's, <laughs> if that's the end... That's... And anybody else? Final question? Any final questions? A lady questions? here. Uh, you mentioned um, the, that once you went to Fiji, well, there's been a, a discrepancy. When you went to Fiji, yeah. was that when you discovered all of this lovely bright colour, or has that always been something close to you? No, I... I we had mixed motives about going to the Pacific. Um, it all started on a Christmas day in London, which was snowing. We were going to a friend of ours, a doctor's uh, Christmas party, and it was snowing hard. Uh, this was a long time ago. And um, I said to Heather that, uh, why are we in London? <laughs> in, in, all this snow and we, we ought to go somewhere where it's warm in the winter so she said well I tell you what I'll write to my friend Bill Geddes who was professor of anthropology at uh, the university in Sydney I'll write to him and see where, where he suggests we go to because we didn't know uh, you know I knew the names of the various islands uh, uh, in the, some of them in the Pacific, it's quite a few, of course, but I didn't. They all, they were all strange. So my wife wrote to Bill Geddes, and he. It turned out that he trained Fijians in the war, in the Second World War to fight the Japanese, and he tra trained trained them in Fiji, and he said that would be a very good place, and particularly Levuka where. There's a small, uh, Fiji is actually 260 islands, it's not one place. And a lot of the islands are uninhabited, of course, they're just tips of a mountain. But a lot of them are, you know, have Fijians on them. So we, we took a, a boat from London, Tilbury, Cunard, uh, to Fiji, and that took six and a half weeks to get there, because we, we, were, we were, you could go in those days uh, if you paid ten pounds. We didn't do. We had, we paid the full, proper price, as it were, the tickets around the world to Fiji and then back again. But you could go to Australia for ten pounds if you if you were an immigrant in those days. So most of the people on the Cunard boat that we went on. 
were immigrants to Australia, but we weren't. We, we went on to Fiji, uh, and then it was a question of finding somewhere to live. So anyway, I, we stayed in a hotel in Suva, the capital, for a bit. We didn't, like, we didn't much care for it. We hadn't come to Fiji to stay there. And uh, so there was a small plane which I could pay for to take, take me to different places, via different islands that had airstrips. And we were, uh, one of them was um, a place uh, I called Overlau. And there, when I went there in a small aeroplane, it turned out that there was a, uh, a German, well, it's, it's a bit complicated, but the Germans had a lot of possessions in the Pacific before the First World War, which they, were, they lost uh, in the peace treaty of 1918. And Fiji was one of them. It was, was a German, and then it was British, and the British took over. So uh, we, we found this lovely house on the hill, which, on a small village. It's a teeny island. It was probably four miles by ten or something like that. And this wooden house on the top of a hill was the German embassy. It had been the German embassy, <laughs> and it was empty. I was owned by a man called Mr. Eastgate and I negotiated with him to rent it and that's where we, we went to Mr. Eastgate's house on Overlau and uh, uh, we stayed for just over a year. And the question was whether, if I'm remembering right, whether the colours of Fiji influenced you? Pardon? I'm sorry, I didn't get the... Whether the colours of Fiji influenced oh, yeah. you. No, that's, uh, of course, that's, that was instantly... My dealers saw that, they all thought that. No, it wasn't like... The strangest thing is that colouring doesn't come from colourful places. It's, it doesn't... <laughs> I'm not. I'm not that sort of. Oh, whatever it is, it doesn't work. It's not. It's not that sort of thing. It doesn't work like that. Uh, you carry your. What I did find interestingly enough is that when I got there and we settled in and the children went to the local school and so on. Um, that I was exactly the same person on this teeny island, as I was in Battersea in London. <laughs> exactly the same person. I had all the same problems. <laughs> I'd taken them with me. <laughs> and I had the idea that if we went there, that I'd get rid of them. But they, they somehow crept in. Uh, so uh, that... So that was that? And that really is the story of lots of places we've been to, because... Really, what's in your mind goes with you wherever you go. Anna, do we have time for any more questions? Pardon? I'm just asking Anna if we have any time for any more questions. Hmm. Yeah, are there any more questions? Yes, the gentleman in the, in the middle. What's right, your question? Well, maybe we should wrap it up. One more, One more question. One more question. You had a question in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, I want to. Uh, your paintings seem very optimistic. They seem very jolly and optimistic. And I wonder what you do with the dark side of your character. Oh, good question. The lady wants to know what do you do with the dark side of your character? The dark side? Yes. <laughs> well. Partly you pretend it's not there. <laughs> uh, yeah, that is a, that's a, that's um, it's just difficult. It's a is there question, one? But it's a difficult. Do you have a dark side? It's a very, well, I I think so. Yeah, I think we're we're all a mixture. We're a licorice all sorts. <laughs> we're a mixture of things. I don't. I think you'd be a freak person if you didn't have a dark side. But 
how you deal with it uh, well I, I suppose the only real kind of answer to such a thing is that you, you try to deal with it in the same way that you deal with your other problems medical problems family problems social problems all the other things that life throws at you and and you try to deal with them as the best you can. Uh, I don't think there's, there's no secret formula. I don't have a secret formula for that. It's just... Uh, but the lady wanted to know what, how, you, how you put those into your work, if you do. Oh, I see. No, well, I... I... Um, I uh, I don't. I don't put anything. I. I uh, what I try to do is to leave that behind, um, and I let the. When I pick the brush up, I've trained myself to forget and everything. So that it's just the brush, really, and the, and the brush seems to do things. It's the same with a pencil or a pen or anything like that, any any material things like that you you just um, you must just let something come and you don't know what it is and so the result of that is that you have these paintings here or anywhere else of mine where they're the result of letting something come. So in some ways, I don't feel responsible at all for them <laughs> because it just happens. And it's not an excuse to get away from the, what we might call the meaning of creativity or whatever that is. But it's, um, it's to get a fresh... Why do you do it in the first place? I mean, why are you sitting down with that brush in your hand? And you do it because there's a freedom at the end of the brush which you can't get in any other way. And that's the pleasure you get out of being of making things. And that's how I see it. It's got actually nothing to do with anybody else at all. <laughs> I think I think that's it. Thank you.